Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Horror Mine, where we talk about mysteries, thrillers, and horror movies. My name is Vic Shai, and in this video, I'll be going over the 2004 horror film, The Grudge. The Grudge is the American remake of the terrifying 2002 Japanese horror film, Juon The Grudge. The film is once again directed by series creator Takashi Shimizu, who wanted to improve on certain aspects of earlier films in the series. The Grudge mainly adapted its story from the 2002 original, while exploring some plot lines introduced in the very first film of the series, Juon the Curse. I'll be recapping the events that take place throughout the film and explaining its terrifying ending. If you enjoy the video, make sure to click the like button as it really helps the channel and I would truly appreciate it. But without further ado, sit back and relax and join me as we explore the seemingly unbreakable and deadly curse in the grudge. Our movie begins by telling us when someone dies in the grip of a powerful rage, a curse is born. The curse gathers in that place of death, and those who encounter it will be consumed by its fury. In other words, they're a woman named Maria wakes up one morning to her husband Peter committing suicide by jumping off their balcony. We are then treated to a pretty cool and creepy title sequence. Sometime later, a caregiver named Yoko goes to the house of an elderly woman named Emma. Do you remember me? It's Yoko. I'll take that as a no. While cleaning up the house, Yoko is drawn to a noise in the attic. Yoko has apparently never seen a horror movie in her life and decides to do some investigating. Big mistake. We meet our main character, Karen Davis, an American student and volunteer care worker portrayed by Sarah Michelle Gellar. Karen has recently moved to Japan with her boyfriend, Doug. On their way to a cemetery, Karen and Doug walk past three schoolgirls, who are a reference to Izumi, Chiharu, and Miyuki from the original film. She is assigned to take care of a woman named Emma Williams, who suffers from dementia. Her boss, Alex, says that Emma's regular caregiver, Yoko, hasn't shown up to work and isn't picking up her car. Calls. Karen arrives at the house and sees Yoko's bike that, as we know, she isn't coming back for. She enters the house, which looks very similar to the one from the Japanese original. I feel that the Saeki house is just as iconic as Kayako herself, and it's important that they kept the general feel and ambience of the house. She finds Emma nearly passed out on the floor and cleans her up as well as the dirty house. Just as she was with Yoko, Emma doesn't seem to be all there and doesn't say a single word. While cleaning, Karen is drawn to a noise upstairs, leading her to a closet that is taped completely shut. She removes the tape, and upon opening the closet, she discovers a mysterious book along with a little boy holding a black cat. She contacts Alex about her discovery and tells him to get over here ASAP. She opens the book, which turns out to be a diary with a picture of Peter, the man who committed suicide at the beginning of the film. She finds the crumbled and torn picture of a family, which has the face of the woman ominously cut out. The young boy in the picture is the boy found by Karen, who identifies himself as Toshio. Toshio appears to have several cuts and bruises on his face, arms, and legs, which hint that he may have been physically abused. The answering machine receives a message from someone named Susan, trying to reach her brother Matthew. Karen isn't able to respond as the house phone is missing and was previously in Yoko's possession. She hears Emma in the next room mumbling, I told them, over and over. Emma finally speaks to Karen and tells her, A large shadow of long black hair manifests in the corner of the room and turns into the spirit of a woman. I would have already been gone at this point because if I see long black hair, I'm no longer there. The spirit hovers over Emma and stares at the terrified Karen before the screen cuts to black. The next chapter takes place sometime before Yoko's and Karen's arrival at the house. We see Emma along with her son Matthew and his wife Jennifer and her daughter Susan. They are being led by this very ecstatic real estate agent trying to sell them the definitely not haunted house. While exploring the house, Emma is drawn to a room upstairs and begins staring at the ceiling. 
I know they all heard that. That would have been my cue to get the heck out of there. In the downstairs bathroom, the real estate agent sees some very questionable bath water that I'm sure someone would be willing to purchase. He tries to unplug the drain, which leads to this creepy moment. So, taking into consideration the loud creepy noise in the attic, the terrified look on your face, and the clearly black bath water, we'll take it. That was easy. The Williams family moves into the house and Jennifer expresses her concern of living in a new country. This is where we learn that Matthew moved his family to Japan for a new job. Jennifer heads to the market and just so happens to buy Toshio's favorite brand of ramen noodles. She is lured by the ghost of Toshio into an upstairs bedroom where the door closes on its own. Matthew comes home and finds Jennifer in a trance in the bedroom. He suddenly comes across Toshio who just wants to show off all the animal noises he can do. What are you doing here? <laughs> Looks like he practiced that one a lot. Jennifer suddenly gasps for air and seemingly dies out of nowhere. Matthew, now possibly regretting every decision he's made up to this point, is killed by Toshio. Back in the present time, Alex comes to the house looking for Karen. He finds her inside the house in a petrified state along with the dead body of Emma Williams. The police arrive and we are introduced to detectives Nakagawa and Igarashi. Their questioning of Alex reveals that all the events up to this point, aside from Peter's suicide, have taken place over the course of a few days. They manage to track the house phone by following its ringtone to the upstairs closet. In the attic, they discover the dead bodies of Matthew and Jennifer, as well as the missing jaw of someone who's probably going to need that. Karen wakes up in the hospital accompanied by Doug and tells him something is terribly wrong with the house. We travel back to the previous day and see the moment Susan left the voice message for Matthew. Matthew and Jennifer aren't around. Leave a message. Hey guys, it's Susan. Matt, are you there? Pick up. Well, I'm leaving work now, so can try my cell or give me a call at home later. Susan is apparently the only one left in the office, because of course she is. She receives a phone call from Matthew, who at this point is already dead. Matthew, stop it. The white ghost of a woman suddenly appears and begins crawling up the stairs. The ghost grabs a hold of the fuzzy on her cell phone and slowly closes the door. Yeah. My fuzzy. Susan runs off and tries to tell the security guard what just happened. It's a pretty awkward conversation where Susan tries to speak Japanese and the guard tries to speak English. The guard grabs his trusty flashlight to search the 10th floor hallway but doesn't find anything. As he walks off, the ghost emerges and can be seen by Susan from the cameras. She rushes out of the building and takes a taxi back to her apartment. While in the elevator, Toshio can be seen stalking Susan as she ascends each floor. Back in her apartment, she receives a call from Matthew saying he's in the building. She buzzes him in and he impressively gets to the 16th floor in the same amount of time it took Katsuya to get to the 7th. She walks outside to see that Matthew isn't really there and hears the croaking noise on the phone. The noise eerily continues even after the battery pops out of the phone. She rushes inside and hides underneath her blanket. She must have never seen Ju on the grudge because those things don't protect you anymore. Her white fuzzy suddenly appears in her hand and that's when she realizes... <laughs> in danger! Susan is then pulled underneath the blanket into obscurity. Back in the hospital, Detective Nakagawa is questioning Karen where she tells him about Toshio. He reveals to her that they found the dead bodies of Matthew and Jennifer Williams. According to police, he apparently murdered his wife and then killed himself. Karen leaves the hospital and meets back up with Doug. On the bus, she tries to tell him what she saw in the house and the ghost suddenly appears in the window reflection. I would consider this a cheap jump scare but it genuinely terrified me, so good job, movie. While taking a shower, a hand emerges from the back of Karen's hair, which has now become a staple of the Grudge series. That night at the care center, Alex comes across Yoko, and we finally find out who that job belongs to. 
Detective Nakagawa reviews the security footage from Susan's workplace and sees the ghost walking down the hallway. Blackness covers the screen and the ghost's eyes stare directly into the soul of a terrified Nakagawa and Vic Shai. Karen begins doing research on the house and finds that a murder-suicide occurred there three years prior in 2001. Husband Takeo Saeki brutally murdered his wife Kayako by stabbing her to death. He then drowned their young son Toshio along with her cat and then hung himself. She also reads about Peter Kirk's suicide, which occurred the morning after. Karen then visits Peter's widow Maria to ask him about his suicide, as if she needed to relive the most traumatic moment in her life. Oh, and here's a curse while I'm at it. She goes through Peter's photos and notices Kayako Saeki creepily photobombing every one of them. The film then cuts back to 2001 before Peter's suicide. We see that he has been receiving numerous letters from Kayako Saeki, although he says he doesn't know who she is. He goes to the Saeki house and comes across Toshio, who doesn't say much but does want to show off his talent. In the present day, Karen speaks to Detective Nakagawa who tells her about the Saeki House murders. As stated in the beginning, when someone dies in the grip of rage, a powerful curse is born. When Takeo murdered Kayako and Toshio, a curse was born and manifested inside of the house. Kayako was turned into an Onryo, known in Japanese culture as vengeful spirits seeking revenge for the wrongs they suffered during their lifetime. Takeo stabbed his wife several times with a box cutter and snapped her neck. This broke Kayako's windpipe, which created her signature death croak as she was still alive and attempting to breathe. This is shown in a deleted scene that was taken out of the film to avoid getting an R rating. He then drowned Toshio along with his cat. This is why Toshio makes cat noises as their spirits are forever linked with one another. Anyone who steps inside of the Saeki house is doomed to die a horrendous death at the hands of Kayako, Toshio, and Takeo, who are extensions of the curse. One can also become cursed by simply coming into contact with someone already cursed. The curse itself acts like a deadly virus, killing everything it touches without prejudice. Nakagawa tells Karen that three of his former colleagues fell victim to the curse and that there is nothing they can do. Reminiscing about his colleagues that fell victim to the curse prompts Nakagawa to take action. He goes to the Saeki house with the intent on trying to end the curse by burning down the house. Inside the house, Nakagawa is lured into the bathroom by the stock audio file of a child crying. He finds an unconscious Toshio who was simply playing possum and is drowned to death by the ghost of Takeo Saeki. Karen returns to her apartment and discovers that Doug went looking for her at the Saeki house. Yeah, let's not leave our cursed research lying out in the open next time, okay Karen? Doug makes it to the house before Karen can stop him and attempts to call her on his cell phone. Karen makes it to the house but Doug is nowhere to be found. She instead comes across Peter Kirk as the house enters a time loop. She sees Peter inside of Toshio's room who seems to notice her presence. Peter also seems to feel her presence, but I do not believe that he actually saw her. Peter hears the ringing noise also heard by Detective Nakagawa earlier in the film and is drawn to a nearby room. The ringing noise can also be heard in Ju on the Grudge, but it's never confirmed what it actually is or what it means. I believe that the ringing noise signals different aspects of the curse taking effect. Peter enters what appears to be an art room with some very questionable art. He discovers Kayako's diary, which reveals her love and obsession for Peter. Takeo discovered this diary, which drove him mad and caused him to murder his wife and son, giving birth to the curse. He discovers Kayako's dead body, which was hidden in the attic. He also finds Takeo's dead body hanging in another room. In this version of the film, it is implied that Takeo hung himself, as stated in an article. However, in the director's cut, Takeo is hanging by Kayako's long black hair, and his body is being pushed against the wall by Toshio. Meaning that like in the original films, Takeo was was the first to fall victim to the very curse he created. In another deleted scene, Yoko is cleaning up inside this very room and can hear a loud thumping noise against the wall. This noise is Takeo's body being pushed against the wall by Toshio and shows that the house is constantly repeating the terrible events that occurred.
It's a shame that so many good scenes were cut out just to obtain a PG-13 rating. Peter, extremely shocked and terrified by the discovery, runs out of the house. Karen goes downstairs and is taken back to the present time, where she finds a petrified Doug. Kayako then begins to crawl down the stairs in a recreation of the now infamous stair scene, which was done best in Jew on the Curse, the very first full-length film of the franchise. Kobayashiku. She crawls her way on top of Doug, who is too terrified to do anything. Dang, Karen, you're just gonna let Kayako take your man like that? Karen tries to leave the house, but Kayako isn't just stealing boyfriends tonight. The entire house begins to rattle as we hear the agonizing shrieks of all the previous victims of the curse. <laughs> Karen grabs a lighter out of his pocket and lights the house on fire. Kayako slowly climbs on top of Karen as the flames grow larger and the screen fades to white. Sometime later, we see that Karen has survived the house fire and her encounter with Kayako. However, a detective confirms that the house is still intact. Karen is asked to identify Doug's dead body, which briefly appears as Kayako, although Karen isn't hallucinating as Kayako appears right behind her, showing that because she was unsuccessful in burning down the house, she is still very much cursed as the movie ends. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was The Grudge. My friends, I thought that this was actually a pretty decent remake. The film managed to faithfully recreate some of the most iconic moments from the Japanese originals, although the theatrical version of the film did omit some pretty crucial scenes that would have made the film a whole lot better. Takashi Shimizu was able to bring back the eerie feel and atmosphere that made the Juwan series so terrifying. I feel that fans of the original series will definitely find some enjoyment in this remake, although it definitely isn't perfect. But my friends, as always, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Thank you all for tuning in, and I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the Horror Mine. Y'all stick around.